welcome back, my lovelies, to the physiology of singing, singing, singing. Yeah. Um, I really debated whether or not to do this topic at all because I really want to get to this other topic, which is like why we all sound different on recordings and why when we listen to ourselves, we're like, that's what I sound like. Are you serious? But then I thought, no, I really need to like stop for just a second and get onto muscles of the face, and particularly like what to do with your mouth when you're singing, right? Because um, it can be kind of a tricky thing and it is pretty important and I think there's a lot of questions about it both in belting, belt singing but especially in classical singing. I think embouchure becomes a thing. Embouchure? Embou what? Embouchure. Like how you're, what kind of is your default baseline shape essentially for your oral opening? And the answer is, of course, it varies. Depends on your vowels, depends on the words you're saying, depends on how loud you're being. But let's unpack that a bit. And then I also want to address a little bit of jaw stuff, just because TMJD, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, is something singers get pretty obsessed with. So I do just want to bring that up briefly if you have any questions, if you have jaw stuff. So in true me fashion, I am not going to go through each muscle of the face individually. If I can figure out my right to left <laughs> appropriately, and this doesn't take me forever to do, what I am going to do is take out my little preclinical speech science book, my super low tech way of doing this. Oh, I'm going to whip this guy around. Hey. And okay, there we go. I figured it out pretty well today. Hey. Okay, it's a little bit, a little bit of an angle, but anyways, here's the muscles of the lips muscles of the lips. I honestly straight up have no idea how whether people do this because I cannot figure out right to left very well. So the fact that it's reversed on my screen, seriously, you guys are like super amazing to me. Okay. Side note. Um, so yeah, tons of muscles around here, right? You got these like circular looking one right here. This is the orbicularis oris. This is the muscle that's the reason why we can go like this. And also, so a little side note, the reason why if you're going to quote Wayne's World and you're going to call someone an ass sphincter, please include the ass part before it because you actually have a sphincter. The orbic orbicularis oris is a sphincter. It, it's of your mouth though. And you do have a separate sphincter muscle for your bum hole. So when they say ass sphincter says what? And he says what? They're calling him a butthole. Okay but you need the butt part of it, okay? Just the more you know, all right? Helping you to keep your uh, insults and movie quotes accurate, right? That's what we really want, is accurate, anatomically based insults slash movie quotes. My, my, my hidden goal for this blog. <laughs> okay, anyway, back over here. So as you see, Tons of muscles here. You got like buccinators, those are kind of your cheeks, kind of muscles that do help you with that sort of thing. Your zygomatics that have to do with some of the smile you do, mentalis, you know, you get to pull down on that. This big old guy here, this is the um, platysma, platysma, I think that's how you pronounce that. It's actually really, it looks like a huge muscle, but it's actually really, really thin. So it, it's, um, my understanding is it's almost more of like a stabilization muscle. It doesn't do, it doesn't actually have a lot of strength to it because it's extremely thin. It's like a sheet thin that kind of goes from here on your jaw and then kind of down that way. Go figure. All right. So um, anyway, lots of muscles. What's up? And... Um, the reason I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of it is because you can essentially activate these muscles thinking about a lot of different things. And one of the ways people do that when they're thinking of classical singing is like you're smelling a rose. Activates a bit of that sort of all those muscles that have to help you with smile. And when people talk about having an internal smile when they sing, a lot of times they actually get an external smile as well. <laughs> they have a little bit of a lift there, right? Um, so classical singers get really into that. I'm going to unpack that uh, concept, I think, in, in just a bit. Let's actually stop off at 
temporomandibular joint. Sounds fancy. It's essentially just your jaw joint. So if you put your fingers back here and you feel like just open your jaw and you feel around where the muscles are moving, or sorry, the bones, sorry. You'll actually feel the bone coming out of that back there. Um, way back here. Yeah. That's your temporomandibular joint. If you have a problem, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, TMJD, which some people just say they have TMJ. Um, TMJD is sort of this umbrella term for somebody has a lot of pain in one side of the jaw or the other, maybe a lot of po painful popping, painful clicking. Um, maybe their jaw gets really tired when they're chewing gum or w when they're having a meal too. It can really affect quality of life if it's bad enough and like just eating, you know, a sandwich is like really taxing for the joint. Um, if you think you might have something like that. Now, popping and clicking is okay if it doesn't hurt. If it hurts, okay? So if on one side or the other it hurts and you're concerned about it, like you can't seem to really relax your jaw enough for singing, okay? Um, then yeah, you can always ask your ask a medical professional about it. Honestly, um, I would ask a physician or uh, ear, nose, and throat guy or something. I would bring it up. Maybe even a dentist. Dentists actually know a fair amount about jaws. Go figure, because of teeth. Um, so yeah, uh, next time you're around someone like that, you might want to ask about it. Um, but in general, I think with a lot of singers, they get really worried that they have TMJ when actually what they have is just sort of a behavioral, conditional, my jaw gets really tight when I'm trying to make a certain sound. And that's not the same thing as having like a dysfunctional, like having this issue, this real like it's there a lot. It's, it's around a lot of different areas of my life kind of issue with their jaw. Similar to laryngeal injury, okay? So like if you have something wrong at the level of the vocal folds, it's not gonna just affect your singing. It might be the first place you notice it, but eventually if you let it go long enough, it's gonna affect everything. Um, when I had, I still have my paresis, but when I had the muscle tension dysphonia secondary to that, it's um, that affected my speaking voice. By the time I got it looked at, getting through a whole day of talking was exhausting and hard, and it was hard to be heard, and as having a lot of these issues that are very common with muscle tension um, due to trying to compensate for this paresis that I currently have and I still do have. The reason it doesn't affect me as much anymore is first off, I get fairly decent vocal full closure, but second off, I've stopped trying to compensate for it. I just let it go. I just let it be easy, right? So similar thing with the jaw here. If you have the kind of like clicking and pain and kind of fatigue if you're eating, maybe there are certain foods you avoid eating because of your jaw. Um, like you don't really want to chew like some nice, you know, steak or something that's kind of really takes a lot of effort here because it hurts. That's when you might want to go talk to somebody about it because that's when it's, it's starting to affect more. It's not just your singing, right? Like that jaw problem is affecting more than that. If you have a tight jaw because you're trying to sound a certain way and you're just sort of tightening up everything to try to sound a certain way or you're doing a funny voice, <laughs> like right there, say you're a character actor, right? And you're doing a funny voice. You're kind of going like really super funny with your voice. I got to tighten up my jaw. And that's just one of the things I'm doing to make that vocal quality, right? I can release it pretty much right after, yeah? So right now I'm not talking like that. I'm not talking like this all the time. It doesn't carry over into everything I'm doing, okay? So if you have jaw tension that really only shows up when you're in voice lessons, that might be more of an overall coordination and you need to sort of discover like, am I tightening my jaw in order to sound a certain way? What's my deal with tightening the jaw? Am I tightening the jaw because I don't wanna open my mouth for that high note because I don't like the high note? Um, in my voice teaching experience, that tends to be a very common thing. <laughs> People are going up for a high note and you say, you got to open up your mouth. And they're like, ah! 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 like they kind of get like, I don't like it. I don't want to hit the high note. And then their jaw gets really tight because they're like trying to keep it from opening. <laughs> so, you know, that's not like jaw tension isn't your main problem in that case. The main problem is you're scared of that high note and you're just like, and you're just kind of giving into the fear 
you're probably in addition to tightening your throat, obviously, or, sorry, tightening your jaw, your throat is probably tightening. You're probably not really using very good airflow. You're probably holding back your air a lot because, you know, there's a bit of self-sabotage when you're really afraid of something and singing, you're afraid of a high note. You're going to kind of like it, there's this cascade effect of, uh Oh, everything, you know, the breath goes away, not, not good airflow, holding the breath. Don't want to open up the mouth because I don't really want people to hear it. That tends to be the biggest, right? Like I don't, I really want to be able to hit the note without someone hearing it, including yourself. Oh my gosh. How many times, right? Uh, how many times have we all been there? But take it from me, guys. If, if you want to practice a note, you're going to have to be able to hear yourself do it. You're going to be the first one to hear yourself do it, okay? So please don't, like, do this when you're trying to go for a big, you know, hey, 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 you know, and, like, try to, like, hum it or something just because you don't really want to hear it. It never really works. It doesn't work out in anyone's benefit. Um, but that's jaw tension that's really situation-specific. So... Not as much of that. If you do have some, and I have this issue too. I clench my jaw when I'm stressed, if I'm really thinking really hard. So it tends to happen to me like um, in graduate school when I was in exams and stuff, I would get done with the exam and be really kind of sore, like back in here. There's some muscles that come back even in kind of back behind your ear around here that's jaw related. Um, and here and stuff because I'd be sitting there thinking so hard I'd be like this and not realize that I'm clenching my teeth because I'm thinking really hard Okay, also people who teeth grind at night that can be something to talk to a medical professional about because that can also be That can cause some issues and it also could be a symptom of some other issue who knows um, but Yeah, so for me like after an exam I would need to kind of massage out my muscles because my jaw just was tight just because I was contracting them the whole time not thinking about it. Situational jaw tension still didn't really want it to be around all the time and also the fact that it gave me kind of tension headaches back here was not the best. So um, I would usually just massage back there kind of taking pads of my fingers and just kind of give myself a nice massage right behind the ears. It kind of feels good. It's kind of like what um, hairstylists do when they give you that shampoo and it's like super nice, they're like taking the hair and like massaging you under there. It's those muscles, the ones where you're like, oh yeah, that feels so good when they give me that shampoo massage thing. <laughs> it's like you're doing that to yourself essentially back there um, without the shampoo. <laughs> and then I guess with the shampoo too and you're in your shower, why not? Then the other place to massage would be your masseter muscle. Your masseter is really big. It was not on that picture actually, but it's a big thick muscle. It's your powerhouse for biting and chewing. When you bite into a really crisp apple, hum, the masseter is the one that gives you the power to like really bite in there. Obviously you need the teeth to cut into the apple, but the masseter is the muscle that's really giving you the force to like bite into it and pull off that chunk, right? So it's a muscle that closes the jaw um, and closes the mandible, which is your lower jaw. Your upper jaw doesn't actually move. In humans, we don't we don't do this. We're not like Pac-Man. Sorry, what the heck? I can't even go sideways. Here we go. We're not like Pac-Man. We don't do this. We just do. Oh, that's okay. This is like really hard to. Why did I do this? Okay, we do that. <laughs> sort of. Gosh, should have practiced that beforehand. I guess right. Like, I can't. I can't. I can't do it. Ah, okay. You guys missed me, right? <laughs> I'm the best. Okay, um, so, yeah. So our jaw opens kind of down and back a little bit. It kind of hinges like that. So when you're really open, your jaw is actually kind of down a little bit and back a little bit. Um, we'll get to that in a second, too, because singers also sometimes jut their jaws forward, especially belters. I'm getting to you. I'm getting to you. So um, if you put your fingers right at your cheek and then clench your jaw, you'll feel a muscle pop up. That's your masseter. You can massage into that guy. Exactly where you felt it go, you're going to massage into it and just kind of release it. You can also do the like heel of the hand kind of from your cheekbones, just kind of letting 
gravity trace down. This one feels really good. It looks weird, but it feels good. Uh, and just being really slow with it and easy. But that's all to help that muscle release. If you're like me and you clench your teeth when you're thinking really hard, when you're in deep concentration, you're taking tests, wherever it is, maybe with nerves, you start to clench your teeth. And you feel like you need to give yourself a little massage poo before, say, like an audition or something. It's a good one to massage. I would stay right where I can feel that muscle. Sometimes people want to massage right above the joint. And in fact, I probably spent a good 10 years or so massaging literally above my joint and always thinking, gosh, my jaw's always so sore because I was massaging here. Now, when I feel my masseter, I'm like here. See, it's kind of, it's, it's forward of the joint where I actually feel the muscle. The masseter is big enough that it does run all the way. Like it's a thick, big, thick muscle. It does run far back. But um, the issue is if you can't feel it, the further back I go, right around here where I feel the joint, and if I start pressing in, I think it's sore because I think it's muscle soreness. It's actually a gland. That's one of your salivary glands. And glands do not like being massaged. Glands don't like being touched. They don't like being put pressured on. Glands are just like, let me just secrete my saliva and leave me alone. Okay. So if you're, <laughs> if you're like me for like 10 years massaging way back here and thinking, gosh, my jaw's always so sore back there. It's probably the gland that you're touching. It might not be the muscle. So just stick with the masseter. And then you can do like some presses and stuff for under here. But you know, stick to where you can feel the muscle and just really focus on that part rather than trying to go further back and being on a gland. Pro tip, don't massage your salivary glands. Massage just the muscles, okay? All right, so that's jaw business. Like I said, jaw tends to open back and down. Uh-huh, even if I'm belting, even if I'm belting, belting. To make sure I'm still going back and down. I think I am. Down. Yeah, probably something. It doesn't feel tight, and I don't feel like I'm jutting my jaw forward. That is something I see a lot with belters sometimes. Is they'll be like, and if I jut it forward, you can hear that it kind of became like super hyper hyper nasal out of nowhere. It's like my sound completely shifted, right? Like it's weird, right? I'm doing some other things. It's definitely affecting everything. Just because, you know, it, it's all going to be connected through ligaments and tendons and all this stuff. And so jutting it forward is probably pulling on some of those other internal muscles, why it's getting super hypernasal, I'm not, honestly not 100% sure. Maybe it's some passive connection to the, to the um, soft palate. You know, it could be. Um, it's not something that tends to be addressed very much in speech and hearing science, I gotta say. Um, so it might be that there's some passive connection there through like tendons and ligaments and things that are causing that. Um, but in general, that can be a thing where someone's trying to manipulate the sound a little too much and so their jaw's coming forward and now their sound's gone really funky. So usually my tip for that is to make sure it's, it's opening in more of a naturalistic, it's like, you know, it can be more of a naturalistic, hey, 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 we're over here, hey, that kind of an opening. Like you're shouting for something, not, not like a... You're trying to make a special sound, right? Um, I saw like a Kristen Chenoweth interview once. Maybe it was on Conan O'Brien. I forget. It was an old one where she talked about learning how to belt and how her teacher used to be like, hey, you over there. Hey, you over there. Hey. That, that's essentially your belt high note position for your jaw. It's just like if you're, if you're shouting. It's going to look different on you because you have a different face. Totally fine. But essentially it's that natural opening up the mouth because you want to let your voice go. You want to let it out. All right. Um, kind of that healthy shout that you would do if you're trying to be heard over noise. Okay. So not like gratingly shout, but hey, 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 everybody. Okay. Um, 
So that brings me to the final point that I really want to make is about mouth opening and what do you do? I've heard the really good adage of, you know, belters tend to use more of a megaphone position, so they feel like they're more like Pac-Man, I guess. You know? Ah, uh, like that. A lot more. And singer, uh, classical singers use more of an inverted pear shape, which is sort of a, oh, where they feel like a lot of openings back here, and they don't, they're not as aware of an opening in the front of the mouth. I'll say it that way. Not that they're not opening their mouth, but you're not aware that you're opening your mouth as much. So when I belt and I'm going for a high note, I'm aware that my mouth is open. I could catch a fly for sure. I'm aware of that. If I'm singing classically and maybe I have a high note coming up and oh my gosh, I'm so out of shape. Seriously, you guys. But if I'm like, uh, you know, I don't know. ease it up a little bit. Um, I'm opening my mouth up, but I'm not as aware that it's opening. I'm more aware of do things feel stable back here? Do I feel like I had a lot of space, etc, etc. I'm not paying as much attention here. Does that make sense? Um, the other thing I've been taught is that classical singers open vertically. That's a good way to think of it too, where you're thinking for yo, yo, like that. A singer currently in the classical world that I think is a really good example of that is Joyce DiDonato. When she's singing in really powerful moments or singing high notes, her mouth is really vertically open. It's very, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, she's making a perfect little rectangle. Um, and her lips are slightly puckered outward and all of that. So you have that, the sniffing of the rose thing, you also kind of tend to pucker a little bit if you kind of go, then you have a little bit of a lift to your upper lip. Oh, and up. Oh, I also heard it as like pinch the lip and pull that forward so you can feel like you're really got that lift in your upper lip. I've heard make sure you can see the upper lip through your peripheral vision um, instead of your lower lip, really show off your upper teeth. I've heard all kinds of things about lip placement for singers just trying to get, I think, Thing is, if you puck your lips out a little bit, you get just the littlest bit of a boost to the lower harmonics. So you're lengthening your vocal tract a little bit, which means lower harmonics get more excitable. That oscuro quality that we're going for as singers becomes a little more apparent. So I think the puckering, now in classical world, remember, chiaro and oscuro, chiaro oscuro, there we even meld them as one term because typically they come together. So the more ease you have, the more pharyngeal space you have, the more oscuro you get, and also the more ease here, therefore the more singers form it, thanks to that space above, like that super laryngeal space that gets a little bit, it has enough there, right? It's compressed enough to have a nice boost to your singers form and energies, okay? So if you puck your lips, you're going to get a little extra boost on the oscuro. Probably by default, you get a little extra boost from the singer's formant too. The chiaro comes along for the ride. Um, if you there's, But there's a lot of variability in this. Here's the thing. So if you watch, and I know I'm already running a little late, so I'm going to try to wrap up here in the next couple minutes. But if you watch various classical singers, if you watch Kirite Kanawa singing or Arlene Arge. I'm going to list a lot of women because I listen to a lot of women singers because I'm listening to them because I'm learning the songs that they're singing. So, <laughs> especially like Mozart and stuff. So, all right. Uh, so forgive me on that. But if you if you watch a lot of those, and like I just said, Joyce DiDonato tends to do a lot of that. Arlene Arge, Kira Takanawa, they don't tend to open vertically as much. They're much more with that internal smile looking a little like, I'm just sitting here singing this amazing Mozart aria. That's all I'm doing. I'm you know, just hanging out. They tend to look a little more like that. And so I'm bringing this up because in truth, it's really individualized. We're all very different internally. Our vocal tract lengths are different. Um, the shapes we're making with our mouth are probably quite different on the inside. So, and, and how we learn how to sing, how we learn to find where that vocal quality is, is going to vary from person to person. So you could sing with a more closed mouth, maybe with more of a smile position. If that feels good to you and you've gotten really great results from that, 
totes fine, you don't need this vertical biz. But if you struggle to find a classical type sound, keeping a more neutral mouth position, neutral lip position, then maybe try the more vertical, slightly puckered, looking at that upper lip kind of thing, you know? Sometimes you gotta kinda try that completely opposite thing just to see if you can find where it is internally. The other big tip I really wanna bring up, and this is true for belters and for classical singers, so biggest tip when it comes to mouth opening and jaw opening and what the heck are you supposed to do with this? Um, interesting fact. Here's the fact that is the take home stick in your head fact. Um, most of the loudness, the most of the variability in the amplitude, the actual measurable amplitude of when we're talking. So, um, stress syllables, you know, putting the emphasis on the right syllable. Okay. You open your mouth up more when syllables are stressed, makes it louder. Okay. So, Mouth opening more, you get more volume out, literally. Mouth closed more, you get less volume out. So when you're trying to figure out something new about your technique, and heck, even if you're an advanced singer, give this a shot. Think of your dynamics being more to do with how open is my mouth and less to do with here. So here, Super stable, super easy production, just like you're blowing through that straw, woo, whatever, you know? Keep that really stable. For dynamic contrast, think about if I can make my jaw just a tiniest bit more close. So a small change in how open your mouth is can actually make a really big difference in the amount of amplitude you're putting out, the amount of like loudness is what we hear as amplitude changes, but I'm talking genuine like amplitude changes. Like you can measure these suckers, okay? So if you need to sing soft, try closing your mouth. Just enough, like not enough to make it tight if you have to do like a really soft floaty high note, but watch several singers. I would challenge you with this. Watch several singers in your style who are really great singers who you feel have a really nice ease to their singing and watch them when they sing a high note, soft versus loud, and see if their mouth is more open on the soft or more closed compared to the loud, to their loud. You gotta compare it within the same person because we all have very different looks, right? So in pop, when you're trying to go up for those falsettos like the I keep it really closed because falsetto-y high notes are really soft. They're pretty soft, easy things. It's easy for me to access it with a closed mouth. Most singers do that, right? You don't often hear like super high, like you might, but you hear, keep it closed. Same thing with a lot of belt world. So when the mouth is closed, they might be singing more in a head voice, yeah. And then when they want to get a little more power, they start opening their mouth more. If only you knew. Right? If only you knew. <laughs> that that's how that works, essentially. So think of your dynamics kind of being with your articulation, essentially, and your syllable contrast and all that stuff, it's really more up here, because this stuff can move around all at once. If you have ease here, and you're able to keep that pharyngeal space and the breath, you're able to keep, essentially, from here down, should feel, feel being the big important word here, it should feel pretty stable, pretty uniform as you're singing, in any style in my opinion. You should feel pretty even, pretty even, pretty uniform, and then you have a lot of changes up here happening. So it's kind of like waves on the surface <laughs> is here, right? Waves on the surface of like a lake or something, maybe a windy day, lots of change here, fine, as long as the deeper waters over here, fairly stable, fairly consistent. I guess a river is a better notion because you can have waves on the top of a river, but you still have a current and the current is not a wave. The current is this ongoing thing that's very stable underneath the water, right? So it's like the deeper levels of the water all moving along. 
the idea of the voice. I like to think of the voice being related more to that current and the words you're singing and the dynamics and that sort of stuff. The more fluid things have more to do with oral cavity. Amount of opening at the lips, how you're shaping the lips, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So I'm going to let that go because that's 30 minutes and that's a lot. <laughs> so as much as I thought, maybe I don't need facial stuff, here I go making a lot of facial stuff. What, what? Okay. But it relates to mouth opening because jaw is essentially, that's the biggest way you open your mouth. Yeah, you can open just your lips like that, but really you don't do this as much. You do that. <laughs> you tend to open your jaw more. So kind of relates to face, jaw, etc., etc. All right. So um, I will see you guys next time. Please let me know if you have any questions. And the next post is essentially going to be the end of the physiology part. Although I could go into neuroscience type things and go more into learning and how we learn uh, different aspects of learning, essentially, like in terms of learning motor coordinations, memory, et cetera, et cetera. So if you'd like to hear that, let me know. I could do it. <laughs> I'm hoping I don't get too um, stodgy with that, though. So, because being neuroscience, I can just start talking way too long about it because it's super cool and interesting to me. <laughs>